as far as the pandemic is going right now, um, I, I know you've you've made predictions throughout the pandemic. Uh, what were, are you surprised that we are where we are right now? I mean, the cases are so high. Yeah. Well, it's a very difficult period because you know the Delta variant has been the wild card in this. It has really changed things. It is much, much more uh, efficient in its transmissibility from person to person, which has caused you know a wave, a uh, yet again another surge. We had three major surges up to now. This is really turning into our fourth surge. We we were down to around twelve thousand new cases a day a few months ago. We're now, last week on the weekly average, we had about 155,000 new cases per day. That's the sobering news. The encouraging news is that the vaccines really do work, even against the Delta variant. But we have a, a, a really unfortunate situation that we have a pretty hardcore group of people that we're trying to persuade them or mandate them if they're not persuaded to get vaccinated. So we have about 75 million people who are eligible to be vaccinated who have not yet gotten vaccinated. That's the key to ending this. I mean, that would be the key. Uh, you would cut down dramatically the number of infections if we got the overwhelming majority of that recalcitrant group vaccinated, which is really a shame, somewhat paradoxical. We have the tools to end this, and yet we're not doing it. Uh, I mean, for reasons that are almost inexplicable, you know, people, because of their science, their, their political bent, uh, feel that they don't want to be told to mask up and they don't want to be told to get vaccinated, which is just completely, you know, as I said, it's inexplicable given the fact that we're in the middle of the most deadly pandemic that we've ever faced in the last 102 years, and to have people, because of the divisiveness in society, not wanting to contribute to the solution, and by doing that, they become part of the problem. But that is, again, the way it is, unfortunately. Hopefully, we can change that. What do you think could change that? Well, I think that if you get trusted public messengers who put aside political ideologies and convince people to get vaccinated. The other way to do it is to have many, many more mandates. I know that that you know rankles a lot of people, but you're going to see situations locally. I don't think you're going to see centrally uh, derived mandates, but they're going to be mandates where colleges, universities, places of business, large corporations, they're going to say, if you want to work for us, you've got to be vaccinated. And I believe that's going to turn this around because I don't think people are going to want to not go to work or not go to college or not go to university. They're going to do it. You'd like to have them do it on a totally voluntary basis. But if that doesn't work, you've got to go to the alternatives. I know the Delta variant is, is so much more contagious um, than the original, uh, but but we've had behavior change too, right? We're, we're going out more, we're traveling more. Um, is there anything that uh, we should be doing differently um, to help people uh, keep it from spreading? Well, you bring, a good, you bring up a very good point. You know, when we got to the summer, you remember with the 4th of July, we were hoping we could turn the corner in the summer. And that's when we started to get the escalation of the Delta variant. But at that time, people felt since it looked like things were under control, and relatively speaking, they were, people got more loose about things. You know, they didn't wear masks as often. They congregated in crowds, sometimes indoors, which is not a good idea. And we saw a letting down of our guard. And with that came the acceleration and the surge of new infections. So even though vaccines work and we have many people in this country vaccinated, you know, we have, you know, 80 plus percent of the seniors are vaccinated. We have about 70 percent of the population that's got at least one dose. Uh, over 50 percent of the population is completely fully vaccinated. Yet we have enough people who are not vaccinated 
that we can't really nail down and just crush this outbreak yet until we get those people vaccinated. With the, the boosters, are, are they pretty much on, on, on the right timeline right now, do you think? Well, yes and no. Uh, we certainly are going to roll out the booster program on the week of the 20th of September. We wanted to do it simultaneously with both Moderna and Pfizer. But as we've always said, that was going to depend on the companies submitting their data to the FDA, the FDA making a regulatory decision, and then the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices making a recommendation. As it turns out, it looks like Pfizer will get their information in on time so that the FDA could make a regulatory determination. Uh, Moderna is a bit behind, not a lot, but enough that it don't, I don't think they're going to simultaneously roll out their booster program. So Moderna may be a couple of weeks or so later than Pfizer. But at the end of the day, they're both going to roll out in a, bo in a booster program, including J&J, &J, which will come in a little bit later. With these vaccines, I mean, things were developed at, at, it's with such record speed and the, the, the science is incredible to see. Um, uh, as you can imagine, uh, a lot of our members um, are interested in HIV. And, uh, you know, we've had such disappointing news about vaccines uh, for HIV. Um, do you have a sense uh, on the HIV topic uh, that we'll ever get any closer to a vaccine for that disease? Well, I think you correctly said that there have been some significant disappointments in the approach that is a non-neutralizing antibody approach that started off with the RV-144 from Thailand and then the African studies. Um, the most recent one just did not show enough efficacy to continue the study. Uh, it just um, was about 20, 25% with the out of bounds below zero. So that means it's not gonna work. So I think what you're gonna be seeing a lot more now is focusing on the neutralizing antibody approach to try and get immunogens in the right confirmation to be able to induce broadly neutralizing antibodies. The African studies in the RV144, you know, were non-neutralizing antibodies. There was a strong hint that there would be efficacy there with the 31% from RV144, but the studies in Africa was even less. It was around 25%. So it is disappointing. Um, but again, you know, HIV is a very unusual pathogen. Uh, the body does not like to make an adequate or a good immune response against HIV. And when the body doesn't make a good response to natural infection, it becomes very difficult for a vaccine to induce an immune response that would be adequate. We're not giving up on that by any means. So I don't want people to get the impression we're giving up on developing a vaccine for HIV, but it is going to be really very difficult to do. We need to appreciate that. With, with HIV, uh, from your time uh, in the very beginning of, of, of that uh, pandemic, um, were there lessons that you had taken away from that, that you've applied to this current pandemic. Uh, it was also a politically charged uh, time in which you were uh, in a leadership position. Well, there were some similarities and some substantial differences. I think one of the lessons learned from one to the other is never underestimate the potential of an emerging infection. You know, HIV came along under the radar screen very insidiously over a very long period of time. We've been involved in it now for over 40 years. The 40 year anniversary was just this past June, but you know, we've had 78, 77 million people infected, over 35 million have died. So it has been a historic outbreak. Whereas with COVID-19, it was much more explosive in a relatively truncated period of time. You have now uh, 635,000 Americans have died and 4 million have been infected. Uh, at, uh, I mean, 40 million, excuse me. And you have 4 million deaths worldwide. The, the difference, the political difference is really quite a difference. Uh, the, back in the days of HIV, there was a lot of activists who were very much 
trying to gain the attention of the federal authorities. They were confrontative. They were iconoclastic. They were disruptive, but they were correct. <laughs> they were right. Uh, the, the particu particularly the LGBTQ community, I, I think if you listen to what they had to say, they made sense. So although they were confrontated at the end of the day, it was very productive to get them involved in the planning and in the implementation of the programs. It's different today. Today, it's all uh, divisiveness without a productive endpoint to the divisiveness. Uh, that's a big, big difference. So I don't think you can pick, compare those types of things from one to the other. There's nothing productive about the divisiveness we're seeing now where the confrontation between the activists and the established scientific and regulatory community back then, at the end of it all, it was a very productive and value-added interaction. There, there was uh, misinformation and fear um, and, and the time, early days of HIV, and, and now there's so much more misinformation and fear. Um, you know, we're, a, we're an association of journalists. So I, I wondered if you had any uh, recommendations on how uh, journalists and, and scientists can better communicate and um, cut through some of the misinformation. Well, I think we need to say don't fail to communicate because we know that the uh, only way to really counter misinformation and disinformation is by flooding the system with the correct information. And that's one of the major roles of journalists is to really be the vehicles for the correct information, information that's edited and evaluated and peer reviewed as opposed to what goes out on the social media, which is much of which is garbage. Uh, and very misleading. So if we can amplify the, the uh, truth and, and science part of it, journalists would, would, would be a uh, help just like scientists will be. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think journalists, you know, classic journalists are a very, very important part of the solution to this very difficult situation we're going through. In fact, we count on journalists to be able to spread the you know evidence-based truth, uh, not just this crazy stuff that goes on in social media. May I ask then? Um, you know, with HIV, we've been for decades working on this. You know, communicating about the problems and and trying to help keep people safe. What's the end game with the pandemic? How how do you see this ending? Will we be doing this for forty years? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I, I, you know, we're fortunate that we have highly effective vaccines. If we implement the vaccine program, we could bring this to an end. We certainly could bring it into an end in this country. It may take a little bit longer for the rest of the world because the low and middle income countries don't yet have the access to the vaccines. We're working very hard to get them equity and equal access to vaccines. That's the reason why we're already given over 130 million doses to 90 countries and we've pledged a half a billion doses plus four billion dollars plus trying to increase the productive capability uh the capacity to make vaccines so we could share them with the developing world is it is it but does it become I, I hate to make a comparison because it's a dangerous comparison, but does it become like flu where it's something that's ongoing and manageable because we uh, have vaccines or? Uh, not necessarily. I don't think we need to assume we're going to have a seasonal uh, confrontation with this virus. I believe if we get it down below a very, very low level mm -hmm. that we may you know, be able to put it behind us and move on. I don't think it necessarily is going to be with us forever but we can learn to live with a, a, a small amount of it. A very small amount, yeah. And, and going forward, one more question. Um, the other role journalists can play in terms of detecting the next pandemic, what else can we do? Well, I, I think report the facts and report the data as they occur on, in real time, right? That's what the beauty of journalism is that it's a vehicle for information that's correct information. And that's why they've got a counter the misinformation that is so prevalent these days. Mm -hmm. Got it. 
Well, thank you so much. I, I know our time is up. I so appreciate you spending the time with our association my, today. My pleasure. It's good to be with you. Thank you for having me.